great to be here. It's great to finally open source Linux Kit. We've, it's something we've been planning to do for ages, and um, and it, it, we had hoped it would be much earlier, but um, it, it took us a while. Um, I'm doing quite a short talk today, followed because we've got three great demos coming up, so I don't want to um, take up too much of their time. Um, we've one of the things about Linux Kit is we've had, we've had some people trying it out a little bit early, and some of them have had even a, you know a couple of weeks to come up with some demos, which has um, been pretty pretty good for of them to to agree to come on stage. I think, um, but they're showing off some really cool stuff, and I think those demos will give you a better idea of how um, Linux Kit works and what you can do with it. I'm just going to give you a bit of background. Um, Linux Kit's got a a cool logo in our new logo style for our kits, um, which doesn't go with the DockerCore um, DockerCon de um, look and feel at all. So, um, so why Linux Kit? What are we doing? And I think the the, the kind of um, origins of the kind of philosophy behind it really came out of the um, the Netflix thinking about immutable servers, which started back in 2011. Um, you know, if you build a server in the cloud. You create the server, you run your application on that server for a bit, and then when you want to make a change, you get rid of that server and start a new server running the change. And every time you, you test it before you ship it, and then you know exactly what you're doing, you don't change your server after you're there. And I think there's another um, one of the people who pioneered the whole immutable delivery thing from 2011. Servers have been around for a long time are kind of scary things that you don't really know what's running on them anymore. People go in and change them, and those changes are not in version control, and you don't know. If you just create the server once, ship it, and then update it, ship it again, then you know what's going on. And for Docker additions, we, re we really needed something that had that amount of reliability, repeatability. Every time you run it, we know exactly how it'll behave. If you want to upgrade, then that's the upgrade process, and we know how it'll behave after the upgrade. Um, and so we started back, originally it was Docker for Mac that the, the first proto part of Linux Kit came with. Um, we needed something you could boot up on your Mac. Every time you, start, every time you press the, start, the, start the Docker whale button, you know, you've got a Linux distro up there, it would always work. If anything, Happened. You could just you could restart it, and it would all be all be there. Um, we couldn't really find anything that we wanted. We kind of looked at boot to Docker originally. We looked at many of the minimal Linux distros back in 2015, and we couldn't find anything that was really kind of small, fast, secure, and light enough. So we decided to work on something ourselves. And eventually, we got to a point where we decided it was also useful for other people, not just ourselves. So we decided to open source it. Um, it really is designed to be quick, small, immutable, fast, and able to be built in a CI pipeline like your, like your, like your software. Why not build your Linux distro in your CI pipeline as well? Um, it, it literally takes 20 seconds to build, as you'll see in, in the example. So you can build lots of them, um, build, test, dispose, build, test, dispose, upgrade, and so on. Um, and it's not opinionated. We include a load of things that are useful for us, but you can replace absolutely everything about it. Um, so the summary of it is it's secure, portable, and lean, and built for containers, and built with containers. Um, we provide a bunch of base containers to get you started, but everything can be replaced. Everything can be customized for the platform you're running on. But we, the, the repo comes with enough stuff that you can, you can get started. There's loads more work and improvement that needs to be done on the stuff that's there. And we're looking for your help doing that. We've already got a community of contributors, some of whom are coming to give demos later from IBM, HP, and Weaveworks. Um, but we've been working with a broader community for a while now to make this into a um, into a successful product. You heard the pitch for the talk from Microsoft earlier. Um, we've been, we spent a lot of time working on support when we're doing Docker for Windows and, and after that for 
making sure everything works really well on the Microsoft platform. Um, other, there's other people as well, actually, who should be on this list. Uh, VMware have been working with us. Um, um, so it's, it's already the beginning of a, a collaborative project. We're hoping that many more people will join in. Um, as Solomon explained in the keynote, we're using the, um, the Mobi tooling to build this. Uh, we'll show you that again in the, in the demos. Uh, Linux Kit's the first use of that tool. And this def we define a config file that tells you everything that you need. So this is a little bit of, we'll, again, in the demos, I'll show you more of the config file. But it's just a simple YAML file. It's a bit like Docker Compose, but for building Linux systems. And you can build in an application into your system and, and boot it up. Um, we, um, it was just a few days ago, actually, NIST um, opened their draft application container security guide for, for comments. And one of the comments right at the beginning was, if you're running containers, you should be using a container-specific OS, um, not a general purpose OS, to reduce the attack service and make it more minimal. And we think this is a really important thing, that you don't want to run a general purpose OS to run containers, you just want to run containers and nothing else. Everything else is just something that someone can use to hack into your system. The smaller, the more minimal, the better. Include only what you need. Use a modern kernel, update kernel. We use, the, you know, we are using 4.9 kernel series and testing 4.10 at the moment. We, we, we keep up to date, keep everything updated. Um, we're doing detailed fuzz testing uh, at work and moving services to being safe languages such as Rust, containerize everything with just the privileges it needs, and testing and shipping. There's a talk at 5.10 um, today about where our security team will talk about a whole lot more of the security side of things. So if you're interested in that, uh, it's at 5.10 in, oh, I forget which track, um, but um, I highly recommend that. We um, manage it off. We we manage clusters of um, Linux Kit using um, a tool InfraKit, which um, we'll talk about. Um, we can talk about more if you've got questions about it. Um, particularly on the summit on Thursday, if you're interested, the developers will be there. InfraKit's a, a tool that we open sourced last year, which is designed to um, basically manage clusters of infrastructure that comes in different types. So often you've got really important stateful services and you've got stateless services and your infrastructure matches that. So for example, if you've got a um, Docker Swarm cluster, the managers have to be kept running. If one of them goes down, you need to do specific commands to rebuild the raft cluster and make sure that the managers are, survive. Whereas the the worker, the worker nodes are disposable, they can come and go, and you can scale them up and down as you need. So InfraKit's really cool tooling for doing this, and um, several of the projects we've been working on um, use InfraKit for managing, for managing Linux Kit. And um, it's not a required component, but it's a great component if you want to build big clusters and, and manage clusters. Man you need some tooling to manage upgrades and so on. Other alternatives, things like Terraform, CloudFormation, which you can use as well, which um, also work equally well. Um, Linux Kit's not too fussy. We've worked with partners on a, and internally on a variety of projects that are built in. Um, we're going to talk about some of them in the demos. Um, a lot of them are around security projects. If you go into the repo in the project directories, there's a load of um, information about these, and we highly recommend you check them out. Um, we've got a project we'll talk about with, um, which Solomon showed a teeny bit of with the Kubernetes. We'll have um, Ilya's going to demo in a bit. Um, the iKernel security stuff, which is really cool, that HPE have been working on. Um, and um, we've been working um, with WireGuard, which is a um, really cool, um, lightweight crypto layer for 
um, container networking, which we want to use container networking, which we're really looking forward to spending more time building it into systems. And also the landlock um, land security module is something that we're really looking at integrating. It's still experimental in the kernel, um, but it looks like it's really excellent for containers. Intel have been working on clear containers support. Um, ARM have been working on ARM64 support. And we've got other architectures coming soon. So there's loads of, of stuff that's in progress that's being incubated inside the Linux Kit project, which we really keep cool, which is really cool stuff. Um, at the moment, if you want to run Linux Kit, the best supported platforms where we've been doing development have been um, on the Mac on HyperKit, because it's you can spin up a whole cluster locally to test it, which is pretty cool. Uh, Google Cloud, we've been using as our CI platform, so we've got really good support for that. Um, but VMware um, is well supported, QMUK VM if you're on Linux. Um, and there's a load of other platforms that we, um, that we obviously have got support for because we um, have Docker platforms on them, AWS, Azure, um, Windows, um, IBM, who are going to talk in a bit of worked on Bluemix support, Intel have been working on clear containers support. Um, so there's the, um, the repo as it is has, um, has a decent amount of support, but there's lots more coming and we need your help. Um, we had hoped to have a nice Raspberry Pi demo for the um, for Docker Khan, but we haven't unfortunately. So if you want to work on that, please do. There's loads more work to do. As I mentioned before, we'd really like to write, rewrite a lot of the system services. We really like Rust um, as a model for system services, and um, as well as OCaml, we've been working with the Mirage team on that. So if you're interested in that, we're really, really keen to start switching stuff over really soon. We're going to have a whole bunch of blueprints for different platforms, the platforms I mentioned before. Um, all the code for running, for building what we use in Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows is all going to be opened up into the repo, so you can help us work on those platforms. Um, and whatever new things the community wants to bring and do with the project, because it's really a very broad project, as you'll see from some of the, some of the demos. Um, there's a summit on Thursday. Come along, and um, if you're coming to the summit, or if you need an invite, let, let me know, and we can sit down and work on stuff, hack stuff. Um, and please... Get started, check it out, hope, um, and let us know what you want to do. And um, I want to bring on um, Nigel from HPE, who's coming up first to talk about the really cool work they've been doing. That's the first half. Oh, and we'll yes. pass that one. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So um, the motivation for this work is mitigation of kernel security bugs. Now, the Docker container engine is an excellent user space, gives excellent user space isolation. But if there's a bug in the kernel, a security bug, which uh, is a malicious actor is able to exploit, there's always a chance they can break into the kernel and compromise cont uh, container security, break container isolation. And over the last five years, there have been over 500 bugs, security bugs reported in the Linux kernel, at least some of which enable people to do this. Uh, today, the best form of mitigation you have available to you is to run your containers in virtual machines. But there's a problem, so every container in, in, the limit, in a separate virtual machine, the problem with that is there is a semantic disconnect between the container engine paradigm and the virtual machine paradigm. The container engine manages namespaces and processes, not virtual machines and operating systems. So in this work, we have uh, used the same mechanisms that provide efficient, secure isolation for virtual machines in hypervisors that are the, the, namely extended page tables, nested page tables, these are features in modern processors, uh, to 
um, build uh, a, 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 a mechanism which we think has a uh, better fit with the container engine, par container engine paradigm. So, uh, and, and that will provide uh, protection against kernel tampering and also protected memory pages. So what we've done is we split the Linux kernel into a small inner kernel, which is less than 5,000 lines of code. That runs in the same mode as your conventional hypervisor root mode, for those of you familiar with this technology. Uh, it's only responsible, though, for managing physical memory and processes. All other resources, all the rest of the kernel code, all your device drivers run in the outer kernel or O kernel mode. Now, this is completely transparent to the container engine and all your applications. So once you start the Docker container engine in O kernel mode, in an outer kernel, every container it creates gets a separate outer kernel. Every process created within a container creates, gets a separate outer kernel. Now, by default, all the physical memory is shared across outer kernels, so we can create these quickly but they form separate protection domains. So that if a malicious actor attempts to tamper with the kernel, inject new code into the kernel, overwrite critical data structures, you get a trap and you're trapped back into the inner kernel just like you would drop out of a virtual machine back into the, into the hypervisor. So as well as being transparent, this is reasonably efficient, we're measuring a three to 6% overhead in terms of war clock time. So now let's uh, get to the demo. So I have uh, under the, the, the podium here a small uh, Mobi or, uh, or Linux kit server on w which I'm running uh, four SSH containers. So two have been started in normal mode and two have been started in outer kernel mode. So we can see what mode we're in by catting proc self o kernel. You can see this is a 4.11 uh, uh, RC5 kernel. So it's fairly new. Um, we, 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 um, so so uh, what I'm going to do is start a, 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 a simple client in one of, one of the SSH uh, containers running in normal mode. Uh, and you'll see it will write uh, a, a, a secret into memory. So just the string something secret. Now that is, at the moment, in the memory of the, uh, that, that client. And no other container should be able to get to it. Unfortunately, we have a malicious uh, client in the other SSH container running in normal mode. Uh, and just for convenience, uh, it's, gonna, it's going to uh, exploit a kernel vulnerability enabling it to scan all physical memory. I'm going to give it the physical address just for the sake of speed. And you can see it's retrieved the string something secret. So the point is, uh, we've uh, broken into the kernel, been able to use uh, a vulnerability to scan all physical memory and therefore broken container isolation. So now I'm going to run exactly the same code, but this time uh, in uh, O kernel mode. So you can see uh, I've got a one, so I'm now in O kernel mode and I'll run the protected, uh, the, the client again. Uh, and uh, it's now, what this has done is it has this time requested a protected physical memory page back uh, from the inner kernel, which means that page is only going to be accessible to specific uh, outer kernels. And, uh, and so now when my malicious client comes along, uh, it's now running, I'm running the same code, but this time in O kernel mode, and I will target the, the physical address. And you can see it's got back the null string. So what actually went on there was uh, when I attempted to scan all physical memory, it hit a, uh, a physical memory page which was not accessible to it. So we'd used nested page tables or extended page tables to set uh, certain pages so they weren't accessible to that outer kernel, and therefore we dropped out of the outer kernel back into the inner kernel. In that case, we remapped it to a zeroed out memory page, which is why it got back in the null string. We could have done uh, other things, such as kill, kill the process. So uh, that's the end of the demo. The key takeaway is we're using the same isolation features that are used in processors to provide isolation between virtual machines and conventional hypervisors, but in a new way, which we think has a, a better semantic fit 
with the container engine paradigm to provide mitigation against kernel security bugs and protected memory pages. You can see uh, this in uh, the Project O kernel directory in Linux kit. You can see our YAML files and, and, and stuff in there. You can find the source on, uh, the, on GitHub under Linux O kernel. Uh, we are looking for collaborators. If this is of interest, please find us on, on, on GitHub or send me an email, nigel.edwards.hpe.com. Uh, our intent is to try and get this into the upstream Linux kernel so that everybody can benefit from it. So thank you very much, Justin. Thank Thanks very much. Um, yeah, as, we, as you can see, we, we've got really cool people doing really cool things with security. Next up, we have Ilya, who's going to do, who talk about something completely different and talk about uh, running Kubernetes on this kit um, and with Moby. As um, Solomon unfortunately gave a sneak little preview of the um, of the teeny bit of the demo, but Ilya actually has done all the work and gets to do the full demo and show you what he's really been working on. <laughs> Thanks, Hello, everyone. Uh, yep. yep. Thanks. Hey, everyone. How are we doing? So, yeah, as Justin said, I'm going to show you full demo of what was shown on stage uh, the keynote session earlier. And uh, this is something I put together in a few days last week. Um, so let's switch to this. Is this one? Yeah, oh yeah, cool. All right, excellent. Yeah, so um, this is something you can find in uh, Linux Git repo and projects Kubernetes. And uh, we're using Kubernetes 1.6, kubeadm, the tool that we wrote as part of the cluster lifecycle. Uh, and we're using VivNet. And uh, yeah, and uh, the, the, yeah, I, th I think LinksKit and ContainerD are really awesome contribution from Docker to Kubernetes community. And uh, one other thing, just to 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 add to this, I think uh, being able to uh, try Kubernetes and something like O kernel would be a really cool thing, isn't it? So the advantages of um, LinuxKit. For Kubernetes, is that you can build immutable, minimal OS images, and ensure low security footprint and reliability of deployment. So you you define a much clearer boundary of what happens at boot, what happens at build time. You don't have to like curl some binaries to get them on a host and stuff like that, right? Or wait for Docker daemon to to start up and then you can run a container or something like that. And it's it's much 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 simpler than than other tools that are, that existed. But now I really like the approach of. Um, much clearer boundary of immutability defined in Linux Git. Uh, and uh, it also makes it really easy to build clusters that are identical to production in your local environments, such as on my Mac that I'm going to do now, right? And uh, the, the whole model of building images from scratch rather than taking a base image. Let's say you go, go to Amazon, you want to build an AMI based on uh, Debian, and you got some stuff that, that happened to be on that AMI that you based on, and then there is some stuff that, that you might find something a bit different in uh, like your Vagrant Debian when you, which you're using locally or something like that, right? Just think about those things. And um, yeah, so it eliminates cloud provider base image variants as well. And it makes it much, much, much easier to customize, let's say, pick a different kernel. Now I'm just going to jump to the demo. It's going to be really quick. Um, here. I'm in um, Linux Git Projects Kubernetes. I'm going to run. So uh, earlier I ran, a, uh, I've cleared this. <laughs> I'll make build this images. Uh, oh, the yeah. images. I've built this earlier. Okay, right, they're, they're fine. So um, there are some VM images here. There's a initRD image for master, one for node, and one. Yeah, and one for node, just this, so in authority. So these, these are the ones that we're going to be using. They're fairly small. Uh, so the node one is a bit smaller than master, something to note, I guess. So now we're going to put master. 
I'm going to boot master and uh, everything that happens now is already on the system. I don't have to go and download anything. All the Kubernetes control plane uh, uh, pods, uh, <laughs> all the Kubernetes control plane components are prefetched in Docker cache and uh, it's all there already. Uh, so uh, let me just run the command I need to run. So right now, I mean, we can look at that process table. I know there's, there's container D running, some run C processes. We're still booting up. We're starting some of the unboot containers now. Uh, and now we can see that, yeah, we're loading images from cache into Docker Daemon. And uh, doing a few more things here. So there's container D and run C processes, NTP, et cetera. So now I can do run C exec. There's a kubelet container. Um, I can run ps inside that. Oh, that's in the process uh, ps kubelet. I think that's going to be it. Yeah, so there's this kubelet sh running inside of that that's waiting for me to initialize uh, master. Uh, run c exec kubeatom init sh. It's a tiny little wrapper script that um, runs kubeatom init and uh, uh, creates the vnet add on. Literally two commands. We're looking to optimize this by uh, providing configuration ahead of time, but more configuration is baked into the image and less is being, uh, less logic uh, happens at boot. So, right, we got, we got that. So now we can run like kubectl get nodes. Uh, here we go. Well, let's wait in for a minute. Anyway, we can already boot our nodes. We should be able to join. Put node sh1. Need to copy these arguments. Those are passed in as metadata. Put node sh2. So we're going to put two nodes now. And I don't need to interact on the nodes here. So, oh, this guy isn't ready yet. Get pods, all namespaces. So this is obviously a demo. Let's see. Okay, so, oh yeah, network isn't ready yet. We wait for the network container, VNet container to get created. I think we are using internet at this point. I forgot to optimize that one. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we can see that more things are happening. Oh, you see one VNet container is running. So, and if you do um, kubectl get nodes now, we should see two of them. Well, one is ready, two are not ready, but we can see the cluster is joining up. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for your work. <laughs> I think Linux Kit is really great for, for demos as well. <laughs> Thanks very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. I mean, we, we only started talking about doing this demo um, at KubeCon. So yeah. um, it's, it's uh, when, and Linux Kit at the point was pretty kind of still under very heavy. Uh, it didn't even run fixes. Docker. <laughs> it, it didn't even run Docker, Docker at yeah. the time. That's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it's it's been really great working with Weave on on uh, and getting this getting this running and getting this proof of concept and it's let's get it into into production readiness <laughs> in the yeah. next uh, Thank few you. weeks. Um, Thank you. Weekend project. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, next up, um, it's been great working with Docker as well. <laughs> I'm looking forward to, to try Container D stuff. Like, I mean, that was, that's the next thing, right? This yeah. Container D patch that I want to try on this. Um, next up, we've got IBM, who um, have also been uh, working with us um, with Linux kits. Um, for, um, from the Blue Mix team, which has um, been great, good fun as well. We, um, and um, I got I got an email from you was it yesterday yes, saying yeah. okay I will do a demo it is working. Sure. <laughs> so um, <laughs> yeah, we re they uh, he renamed a bunch of stuff last week and uh, my demo was called into question, but we're good. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'm Dave Freitag. I, I work with IBM. Um, I've been working with Justin and his, his team uh, for the past maybe three or four weeks um, on working on getting Linux Kit uh, built locally and uh, get it out to IBM Bluemix um, and running a pre-built VM image on Bluemix here. So uh, 
Yeah, let's see. I've got my, this is more of a practical um, view of the uh, YAML file that I'm using. Um, this was kind of our motivation just to be able to predefine the VM um, and uh, so that we don't have to worry about you know, what kind of uh, changes have been made to all of our VMs. So uh, I'm using their basic kernel. Um, I've added in a console uh, because Bluemix allows console access to the VMs. As for the initialization containers, um, I've added in uh, my own init container which, contain, which in addition to all the initialization stuff uh, that's provided by base Linux kit, it also adds uh, a Docker client to the VM so that you can see um, just from the console um, anything that's going on in Docker if you log in through the console. And then the rest of the, uh, the Linux container, or the Moby kit, uh, Linux kit containers. As for the on boot stuff, um, the basic on boot containers uh, that are built into the, uh, the Linux kit base image. In addition to those, I've added my own metadata container um, so that we can bring up networking um, and add SSH keys, all that stuff that you need to do when you deploy something out to a cloud. Um, and then our services containers, um, I've added a, a um, administrative container, an SSH server that also has a Docker client on it um, so that you can log into the container remotely or log into the VM remotely. Um, and then also a, uh, the Docker daemon itself. So in order to build all of this, since I've got some custom containers in here, I have a script. That goes through and builds all of my container images and then rebuilds the, uh, the Linux image itself. Um, and then once this image is built, it's in a VMDK format, is the output format I chose. Um, I use that um, along with uh, VirtualBox to turn it into a virtual hard drive, which I can upload to Bluemix. Now, uh, the, let's see here. I'm gonna have to, oops. Um, the upload and deploy process is a little long. I've actually, I've already deployed a copy of this uh, out in my cloud. Uh, I've, I've deployed two copies of it actually, Moby, uh, Moby Manager and Moby Worker, if you didn't uh, recognize Linux Kit last week was still called Moby. Uh, so all of my stuff is still named Moby. Um, but yes, I've deployed a manager and a worker out there. Let's just get that IP address here. Can I get that smaller? There we go. An IP address. Uh, We've got key, uh, SSH key access here, so no passwords. Uh, I've customized my little SSH uh, banner. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, as you can see, we're on Moby. I've got my, I've got my Docker client running. Um, I can talk to the Docker daemon. And I've actually put these two Moby images uh, in these Moby VMs into swarm mode, so they're ready to take a swarm application. Um, so that's effectively how I'm using it. Um, and it's been a real joy working with Justin and his team. Uh, and look forward to doing more here. Um, we'll certainly be continuing down this path. So thank you. Right, well, if um Got five minutes left for questions. Um, if people have got questions, I'm sure. Um, we're, um, I, I'm, uh, we're all around for the rest of DockerCon. If you want to come and find me, um, I'll get my maybe mingle stuff sorted out. But do come and um, do come find me um, or and Rolf's here and many of the other people who have been working on this. So come, please come and ask us questions outside here as well or afterwards. I'll be around. But if you've um, got questions now. We're happy to take them because I'm sure there's things. Give Jerome some exercise. <laughs> Test, there we go. Uh, what's the status for building AMIs? We're talking about VMDKs, ISOs. Um, What's the AMI or the, Azure? Yeah, the AMI status is that um, I, uh, it, 
we pretty much had all the code. We have all the code for Docker for AWS, and we haven't put it all in the repo yet, but most of it's done, and I, I'll, it should, there's a, um, there's a project AWS section that's got most of the notes to where the pull requests were and things. I'll tidy it up in the next, um, in the, hopefully by next week. So, so. so is it something we can do now, or do we just need to wait till the tools are released to start building AMIs? Is it like a long process? If we no, no, to... it's not. It's not very. I mean, you can build the raw disk image. They, you just need, um, you just need the little script. I can. It's re it's really quite simple. Okay, I'll come. I'll come um, but I can. Um, I can probably show you kind of by hand, but it's yeah. We should we should have we meant to have it done in time for DockerCon, but unfortunately it kind of slipped. But yeah, it's all the all the base things for actually building the image are there. It's just a nice bit of tooling to actually um, do kind of um, the last the last bit of creating the the actual disk image. Um, I can't remember how much of the stuff is in the closed pull request, but most of it's there. Okay, thank you. Hi, I saw in one of the slides that the Linux kit has been proposed to the NIST guidelines. Um, what's the status on that? Sorry, no, no, not Linux kit specifically. The, the NIST guidelines were recommending that people deploying containers use a minimal container-oriented distro, not Linux kit specifically. Um, but that, their recommendation was that you should you should do, use that rather than a general purpose distro. Okay. Do you know if that's a proposed recommendation or like it's an official recommendation? It's currently in consultation. It's the draft. It's the draft um, running containers report that came out last week. Okay. I can probably Thank find you. the link to it for you. We have time for a couple of more questions, but before I forget, uh, remember to um, rate the the sessions on the mobile app um, to help us to shape the program of future Docker cons. Uh, I might have missed something, but uh, is this just for like virtual machines, or can be used for bare metal? No, we've got um, some support on bare metal. We have um, it, um, some integration with Packet.net, and we have um, the, the HP demos run bare metal. So yeah, we it was the original Docker platforms we were running it on were all virtual machines, but we've got loads of people who want to run on bare metal now, and we want to run bare metal for testing. VM type applications like the ones HP was showing and other ones, so um, there'll be increased support for bare metal. We're, yeah, we're really interested in running it on bare metal. And Raspberry Pis. <laughs> Hi, is this, uh, I have a question around, um, I see Linux kits in its own repo, and uh, VPN kit is in the Mobi repo. I'm over on this side, over here. Hey, sorry. Stand in polka dots. Uh, so, where, do, where should we get started? So InfraKit's still in, in Docker, and uh, Linux Kit's his own organization, and, and Moby has a few with VPN Kit. Where would you say the, the hello world is? Um, the, yeah, we, we, we're, we're still in the process of moving things around. So, we, um, we, were, we were moving a load of repos in the keynote, and not everything is in its final. Place, but um, at the moment, um, the Linux Kit stuff is um, standalone, and you can do everything from Linux Kit. Uh, and it, but it will be um, will be properly using the, the tooling from Mobi um, probably later today, as soon as we get around to to, change, to adjusting it. So it's a, it's a little bit in transition. We were trying to move everything during the keynote, but it was a bit of a um, fraught experience if, if you've ever moved GitHub orgs around in a, in a frantic way while, while Solomon's talking. <laughs> um, but it, um, yeah, if you, the next kit is, is currently standalone and, and you should be able to use it standalone and things, the redirects hopefully all work and hopefully everything is still building but I need to double check everything once I get, once I get back. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm trying to get a, a picture on what the story will look like in the future around um, uh, namespaces and Linux kernel security modules and stuff like that for, with respect to InfraKit and, and possibly correlating what Nigel uh, presented. Uh, um, I think the, I'll, I mean, our long-term aim is to make sure that um, containers are absolutely as 
totally secure as they can possibly be, and everyone is completely confident about container security. Um, containers provide good security now, but there's loads of things that can still be improved. Um, and we want to help people who are working on all those areas of improvement and, make, and Learnscape gives us somewhere where people can try things out and we can help get things upstreamed. We can um, provide an environment where people can test them and we can um, basically, we have people internally working on, on a lot of these areas inside the kernel and so on. So it's, it provides a, a collaboration space where we can, we can make these things absolutely as, as good as they can be. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yes, sort of. <laughs> and one last question before yeah, we wrap. Yeah, question here. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Um, um, how far it is from production ready? Sorry? How far it is from production ready? Um, we, um, we're going to, um, we'll be shipping the, we, we basically did a lot of rework when we, to, um, on those kits, so we, um, but we're going to, we're going to be shipping the um, Docker editions on the new open source one with the blueprints in the open source one and, um, this quarter. Oh. So we, we're confident. It's very close. It's kind of close to what we had before, but we've just done a lot of rework and broken a lot of things and, as I said, accidentally removed the um, AWS support and things like that. So we need all that stuff back. But you know, we're, we're going to be shipping in production this quarter, and so we're happy to support other people who want to do that too. All right. Thanks, Justin, once again, you and your team. Uh, again, if you like this session, I invite you to rate it on the mobile app. If you didn't like the session, they don't rate it and it will be fine. <laughs> Thanks.